honor to be here with you. Um, I consider it an especial, a special honor because uh, some of you know my background. I was a um, pastor for 17 years, and I've been now a professor for 17 years. I started when I was five, obviously. <laughs> You've heard the phrase, black don't crack, Asian don't raisin. We <laughs> yeah, I'm getting an amen on that. All right. <laughs> Write that down. Preach it this Sunday. All right. <laughs> So 17 years in the pastoral ministry, 17 years in the academic world, I guess my career has been split almost evenly, half and half. And I, I take great pride in that because I've, I've seen my, I see my writing and my teaching and my work in the church as the kind of the both and, that I've always wanted to be uh, academically astute and to be able to think um, uh, the gift that God has given me, the opportunity to study and the schools that I've been able to attend and teach at, um, I feel uh, gifted and blessed that I've had this opportunity to, to be in the academic world. But I really, really value those 17 years in ministry, that it is, that itself is also a gift. So what I'm going to try to do today is to thread that needle between the academic world and the ministry world, because uh, that's part of what seminary does. Uh, we bring the research that, again, God has allowed us to do, uh, but hopefully in a way that serves the church. And that's what we want to talk about today when we talk about evangelism and justice, biblical evangelism and biblical justice. And I'm going to offer a couple of uh, framing devices. Um, and I'm going to give you not just the kind of my, uh, my thoughts on evangelism and justice, but also a practical approach that, that I've been teaching on how to do practical theology. And so that's, it'll be a both end. It'll be how to do practical theology and the application specifically in the area of evangelism and justice. And I'll begin with the idea that every generation and every kind of cultural expression uh, of the church has had to define evangelism for that generation. So if we were to look specifically at the iteration of U.S. evangelicalism over the last hundred years, and we look at the builder's generation, that's the generation that went through the Depression and fought the World Wars and fought the Korean War. And so there was a particular ethos for that generation, again, oftentimes known as the Builder's Generation. Uh, that generation knew very heroic individuals. And so the generational dynamic for that particular time was probably Billy Graham. And we could argue that Billy Graham as the kind of consummate evangelist for the Builder Generation, the heroic individual that individually stands up there presents the gospel, and thousands and thousands and maybe even millions come to know Christ as their personal Savior through this kind of individual heroic person standing up there and preaching the gospel. Uh, but the next generation, the boomer generation of many maybe in this room are a part of, the boomer generation actually had a different mode of evangelism, and we could probably characterize that mode as uh, represented by maybe the Rick Warrens and the Bill Hybels. And then we started seeing evangelism through what we would call seeker-sensitive churches or attractional churches where people will come to the church, hear the gospel, and become followers of Jesus. So um, it's, it's still the same gospel, but it was finding a different contextual application and expression. Uh, Gen X, it's interesting that I don't know if a, a, an actual Gen Xer led the Gen X form of evangelism. Um, it's kind of the missing generation there. Um, at first, there was some kind of talk about, is, is Brian McLaren representative of the Gen X generation? I actually think that wasn't the case. I actually think um, the recently deceased uh, Tim Keller was probably the best uh, expression of evangelism for the Gen X generation. Uh, it was urban. It was church planning. It was innovation. It was engaging the arts. Uh, it was trying in many ways to be multicultural. Uh, so maybe Tim Keller represents the Gen X expression of, of evangelism. Uh, the question is, the next two generations, Gen Y, Gen Z, otherwise known as millennials, and I, I just heard the recent phrase, uh, Zoomers, to represent Gen Z, as in they're kind of going back to the boomer generation, but also they've spent a lot of time on Zoom. Uh, so you've got the millennials and the Zoomers, Gen Y and Gen Z, and the question is, what is the mode, expression, specific cultural contextualization of evangelism for those generations? And uh, what I'm going to um, push towards is that the integration of evangelism and justice uh, is the mode of evangelism that we need to engage more deeply going forward. 
Now, we've been doing some of this stuff already. Uh, please don't be mistaken that uh, the black church has been doing evangelism and justice just fine uh, all along. And I'm, my, my current book project is actually on uh, black evangelicalism in the 1960s and 70s, featuring uh, our very own uh, Bill Pinnell and folks like Tom Skinner, uh, who were you know, 40, 50 years ago, already advocating for the intersection of evangelism and justice. Uh, if you look at immigrant churches, the Spanish-speaking congregations, uh, Asian-American congregations and its immigrant generation, you will repeatedly see evangelism connected to acts of justice and acts of social service and social action. So it's not to say that it's been absent in American society. It's to say that there have been dominant forms of evangelism that we've assumed and that that has dominated the narrative of our evangelism. But what do we begin to think about new expressions or revisiting kind of the older expressions of evangelism that probably better integrate justice and evangelism than we've seen in previous generations? So that's our kind of overview of how do we begin to think about evangelism for the next generation and what are the key themes you want to examine there. And um, I want to approach this by offering uh, kind of three basic steps of what we call practical theology uh, or applied theology. And the three basic steps are right up here, clarification, conceptualization, and confrontation. I want to walk you through those three steps to talk about evangelism. Uh, clarification is simply understanding the context of your ministry. What's going on in your neighborhood? What's going on in the larger culture? This is a pretty basic, important step that most of us oftentimes miss, that it is important, for example, I was a church planter, I was part of four different church plants. It was important as a church planter to know the community into which I was planting a church. Uh, it's, it's important for missionaries to go to a community and to know the language that is spoken there, to know the culture that is in those communities. It, it feels very basic, but oftentimes we miss this step uh, before we begin to do the work on the ground or before we begin to even kind of formulate our theological opinions and ideas and thoughts, we need to understand the context into which our ministry goes. And of course, there's a difference between urban and suburban and rural. There's a difference between East Coast and West Coast. I've lived in Boston and Chicago and New York and Washington, D.C., and now uh, the L.A. area, and they are very different in terms of ministry context. In fact, L.A., you walk like one block over and you're in a different ministry context. Uh, so you know that uh, context is important. So that's the first step. Understand our context of ministry. The second step is, what is the biblical theological content? And the idea of conceptualization, what are the concepts, the biblical concepts that speak to our context? And then the final step, of course, what is our methods, our practices, our actual practical ministry? What do we actually do in terms of confrontation? It had to be an alliteration for you preachers out there, so maybe confrontation isn't the best word, but you get the idea with the 3C alliteration. So we're going to walk through this process to talk about what evangelism can look like for this current generation and what evangelism can look like in the church, particularly in the U.S. and North America. I just came back from Toronto uh, speaking at a um, series of lectures in, at Tyndale College, and uh, it's very interesting what questions are being raised in Canada and in Toronto, very similar to the U.S., maybe especially on immigration about 10, 20 years behind, because their immigration is about 10, 20 years after the immigration wave here in the U.S., but they're also asking very similar questions. So we're going to walk through this process of clarification, conceptualization, and confrontation. Let's begin with clarification and talk about how do we understand the world that we're living in right now? What are the barriers to evangelism? What are the challenges to evangelism? What are the maybe positive spaces of evangelism? And I'm uh, drawing from the work of Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman. Uh, and Berger was a sociologist at Boston University in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, he passed away maybe about three, four years ago. Um, and Peter Berger was writing around the time that across the river from Boston University at Harvard Divinity School, a school of thought was emerging. Uh, it was called the God is Dead movement. Some of you might have heard of this in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Harvard Divinity School was the epicenter of that movement. The basic idea of the God is Dead movement at Harvard was that these, um, the church uh, was maybe no longer necessary. Maybe God was no longer necessary. And the assumption was that secular society had come of age, had achieved a, a humanistic success that maybe we don't need God anymore. So the idea there, coming out of Harvard Divinity School, this theological approach was, the world is such a good place now 
Do we really need God? The world and humanity has advanced so much. Uh, is there a need for God? Hence, the God is dead movement. Now, across the river from Harvard Divinity School is Boston University, uh, you know, kind of an erstwhile uh, Methodist school. And um, Peter Berger, who's a Christian, is writing from Boston University, not as a theologian, but as a sociologist. And Berger is writing in response to what's happening at Harvard, again, not as a theologian, but as a sociologist. And his approach to kind of combat this God is dead movement is actually to say, let's take a close examination of our society. And when we examine our social reality, we realize that we are broken. We are sinful. There is evil in the world. Hence, God is not dead. We actually desperately need God. So Berger has a very fascinating kind of approach, uh, academically, intellectually, as a sociologist responding to this uh, theological movement. So Berger offers three categories through which social reality emerges. Externalization, institutionalization, and internalization. And I will explain each of those in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in order. Uh, the first idea is that social reality is formed when individuals come into a system uh, or help form a system, and they externalize their individual values, ideas, into that system. It's a pretty basic concept. Um, I was a church planner. I said four times over I was a church planner. Uh, the key church that I planted in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, I had um, I got together about six or seven friends of mine, uh, folks that I've had worked with at uh, InnoVarsity, and, and they were students of mine at InnoVarsity. They had graduated. They were looking for a church. And we got together in a small apartment in, in Boston. And we, each of us, began to externalize our thoughts and ideas about what a church should be. Uh, one person said, I grew up in a church that had very strong expository preaching. We, we really studied the Word of God together. I like that. Can we do that in our church? that value system was getting externalized from that individual. Another person said, I come from a church that did a lot of uh, uh, contemporary worship, and that really spoke to me. Uh, can we use that as our form of worship? And that got externalized into the group. Uh, another person said, I was in a church that didn't do much for the community, wasn't really involved in the needs of the neighborhood. Uh, I would like to see a church do that. I'd like to see a church that can, gets involved in the community. And that got externalized. So what you're seeing here is that a system is being shaped by the influence of the individual into the system. The individual's values, uh, way of thinking, uh, lifestyle, ideas gets externalized in such a way that the individual shapes the system. Now, let me stop here and say that this is probably the central and maybe the primary and the dominant way that North Americans view how change comes. Bring in the right individual to change the system. We think about this politically. If we elect the right president, that person will elect the right uh, Supreme Court justice, and we will have a changed society because we got the right individual into government office. This is also the way we think in terms of church. If we get the right senior pastor, we have the wrong senior pastor for 10 years, but if we get the right senior pastor this time out, or as a pastor, you say, if I could only get the right board chair, that would solve all of our problems. And so there is kind of this uh, tendency to think in these individualistic terms. Change comes when you bring in the right individual for the right position. And I would argue that that is probably the dominant mode of understanding change when it comes to the North American church. But the social reality is that there is another level of engagement when it comes to social reality, and that is this process of institutionalization. And that's the idea that systems and structures take on a life of their own that outlive the founders and the individuals that founded that ministry in the first place. In fact, good ministry should do this. Um, I planted a church in 1996. I was a pastor there for 10 years, and in 2006, God called me to teach at North Park Seminary, and I left that church. The, the church didn't fall apart. Thank God it didn't fall apart. It actually sustained because the institution of the church that I helped to found it actually continued. In fact, those of you who follow church planning statistics, uh, the statistics are that within the seven, 10 years of a church plant, all of the founding members are probably gone. Why? Because church planners are ADHD and we just can't stand being in one place for that long. Uh, so there is, it is very often that churches will be planted and within seven to 10 years, the founders are, are gone, but the institution of the church took on a life of its own and actually now will continue. 
uh, this should happen to churches. It happens to seminaries, where the founders of an institution start an institution. Those founders are long gone. Uh, they, they leave their names behind on buildings and on chairs, but those founders are long gone. But the institution continues. Uh, same thing with denominations. Any kind of organization, school boards, uh, governments, uh, a, a good system will continue beyond the individual's that founded the system, which means that the system has taken on a life of its own. So I want to address these two before we get to the third, which is there are two ways that change in systems occur. One, the individual shapes it, and two, the systems and structures have a life of their own. These are both social realities. And my uh, ethicist mentor, Stephen Mott, would put it this way. We must confront evil in its proper geography. If sin is in the individual, of course we confront that sin through personal evangelism, through personal individual discipleship. But is it possible that evil is also in the systems and structures? That racism is not just a personal problem, but it is also a systemic and structural problem. That sin is not just a personal expression, but it is also found in the systems and structures. And I'll, I'll give this illustration in my ministry background. So I. My, my, my Christian background is really interesting in that my grandparents um, are from North Korea, and they were from Pyongyang, which is currently the capital of North Korea. Some of you might or might not know this, but Pyongyang, the capital, current capital of North Korea, was the center of major revival on the Korean Peninsula. In fact, what happened in the early 20th century, in the 1900s, early 1900s, was that there was this massive revival on par with the Great Awakening, on par with the Welsh revivals. It was an indigenous movement. These local churches, most of them Presbyterian churches, were experiencing this massive revival. My grandparents, I found out very recently, were actually young adult leaders as part of that revival at one of the key churches in Pyongyang. Now, during the war, many of the Christians in Pyongyang leave and move to the south, and they move to Seoul, uh, the capital of South Korea, and they stay in Seoul, and they actually start the churches that become the mega churches the next generation later. Seoul Baptist Church, Yangnak Presbyterian Church, uh, Yoida Fu Gospel Church. These are the children of those who had experienced the revival in Pyongyang a generation earlier. They moved to the South, South Korea, and they actually spark the many mega churches that you know about today. Uh, my parents met at Seoul Baptist Church. At that time, at that time, would have been the largest Southern Baptist church in the, in the world. And so uh, you're seeing this kind of revival that's occurring. So I have Presbyterianism in my background, which is always good in the Korean community. Uh, I have a kind of a Baptist immediate, uh, immediate background in that um, my parents met in the Baptist church. And then when we moved to the U.S., we joined a Southern Baptist church, a Korean Southern Baptist church in the D.C. area, one of the first Southern Baptist Korean churches in the U.S. But um, after a while, our senior pastor retired and we brought in a new younger senior pastor. And this is when I was a, 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 a youth student and college student. And the younger senior pastor was Baptist, but he was really Pentecostal. He was a kind of a hidden Pentecostal. So our church became Baptist and Pentecostal. It was so awesome. We had, and, and those of you who have been in both of these world, worlds, we had the best youth retreats, right? I mean, both Baptist and Pentecostal in our youth retreats. So the first night, we were good Southern Baptists. What did we do? Made sure everybody comes down the aisle and pray, and they accept Christ as their Savior, right? Good Baptist. Second day, we were good Pentecostal. We cast out all the demons. It was, the, <laughs> it was such a fantastic experience of that both personal salvation and casting out the demons. And I remember as a youth member and as the uh, eventual youth leader of that group, uh, that second night, when we were casting out the demons, singing, oh, somebody identified this 14-year-old boy. Uh, he has the demon of lust. Oh, no, he's got four demons of lust. And so all of us gathered around this 14-year-old boy, casting out the demons of lust in this 14-year-old. Now, many years later, having been a parent to two teenagers, I really wonder, did that 14-year-old boy need any demonic help to be horny? Uh -huh. my, my guess is No. <laughs> A 14-year-old boy needs absolutely no additional help <laughs> to be lustful. That's just part of their 14-year-oldness. Their so now I look back, and again, do not try this at home. I have four theological degrees. I can do this. I play a game called If I Were Satan. Again, don't try this at home. I play If I Were Satan. 
If I were Satan, what would I do? And let's say that I have a limited number of demons under my control, which is true, right? That's in the Bible. Satan has a limited number of demonic forces. And if I had that choice, would I send four of my limited number to a 14-year-old in Northern Virginia? <laughs> would that be an effective use of my resources? <laughs> or <laughs> do I take those demonic powers and principalities, as Ephesians 6 says, and you put them in the systems and structures. So yes, you can make a 14-year-old be lustful, or you can create a system and structure in society that is lustful. You can make an individual greedy, or you can develop an entire system and structure that operates under the principalities of greed. And so it is a both and. Yes, we confront the sin that is in the individual, but we confront the evil that is in the systems and structures. There's a third level that began to kind of appear to me as I was working through Berger and Luckman's analysis, and that is the third level of internalization. And what happens with internalization is that the system and structure not only takes on a life of its own, it begins to influence those who come into that system. Again, we see this quite often. In a good way, I saw this in my church, my church plant. And I had an intern coming in. He was a, a seminary intern. And I said, I want you to spend two months just visiting uh, the, the small groups in our church and tell me what you sense. And he came back and he said, essentially, the, the community had internalized some of the narratives in our church, the good ones. And I said, well, tell me about an example. He said, well, there was a small group that I went to was made up of, of, of young adults who were kind of tech employees and they, you know, they, were, they had good jobs. And one of them had just, just gotten a, a high paying job at a tech firm and he was thinking about buying a computer and the whole community was like working with them on stewardship of that computer. And he says, almost every other church I've been in, they would say, buy the best and, you know, spend on as much as you can on that computer because it's part of your job. It's part of your career. But this community was saying, say, but if you spend a thousand less, could you give that to the children's ministry? If you spend a thousand less, could you give that to the work of uh, the, the intervention we're doing with gangs? And so that became a part of the narrative of that community. It had become internalized to such an extent that folks were living out these values, even if it's not being preached from the pulpit necessarily or spoken about, it had become a part of the community. So that can be a good thing where a community internalizes the positive values, but we also can see where a community internalizes the negative values. So now we are confronting sin in its individual presence evil in its structural presence, but also the possibility of evil in its narrative imagination presence. And this is where we, again, as Stephen Mott says, confront evil in its proper geography. And when we talk about narratives, we need to address that narratives are not so easily addressed. Narratives are so internalized that we are, it is harder to identify. Think of it this way. I'm a huge fan of movies. My son and I go watch movies uh, twice a week, actually. Um, and one of the things I love about movies is good acting. And uh, good, some good actors use something called method acting, where they really get into the character of a, of a, of a, of a, of a character. So, for example, Robert De Niro, when he uh, uh, was uh, acting in a movie called uh, Raging Bull, he was playing a professional boxer, boxer Jake LaMotta. Uh, he actually fought 10 real professional fights before he went on camera. Why? Because he wanted to embody that experience of being a real boxer. He wanted to move like a real boxer. And after 10 professional fights, when he's on screen, he looks like a real boxer. He had embedded and internalized that character so profoundly that his impulses, his reflexes operated out of that experience. A uh, similar thing happened with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, who was in a movie called My Left Foot, and he played someone who was paralyzed. And when he was on set, he refused to leave the wheelchair. So he had to be carted around in a wheelchair when he was on set. Off camera, he would come off. Uh, he, he, it didn't matter if he was on camera, off camera. If he was on set, he was in that wheelchair. What does that mean? He so internalized that character, when it came time to improvise, it was real. It was accurate. And so we can do that in a good way where we internalize values and understanding of the world in such a way that we externalize it in a good way, or we internalize the negative values in such a way that we end up externalizing the negative values. And so when we talk about changing, for example, the negative internalized values and narratives, you can't beat a narrative with more of the same narrative you need what's called counter-narratives that operate in the opposite direction. So if there is a momentum in one direction, 
The worst thing you can do is add to that momentum. What you need to do is create a counter momentum. So think of it this way. You're, uh, I'm a city kid, but I, I hear that there are some things called John Deere tractor trailers somewhere out there in the world. But if you're out in the countryside and you're on a farm, uh, picture like this huge tractor trailer tire ho hollowed out at the top of a hill. And at the bottom of your hill is your pet cat or pet dog, and you're at the middle of the hill. When that tire starts rolling down the hill, you want to save that, that pet. So what do you do? Well, I'm the heroic individual. I'm going to save this with my heroic individual that has pulled himself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to stop this thing. You step in front of that tire, and you're pancaked. You're, you're gone. Because that momentum of that narrative is too strong. And then you say, oh, let me try a different approach. Let me jump into the tire and try to change the system and structure of that tire and create it. And then you get into the tire, but the momentum is so strong, you actually get caught up in that momentum. And now you've added weight and power and more to that momentum. So you've tried to change the world individually. You've tried to change the world through systems and structures. But did you try to change the world through changing the narrative, changing the imagination? which again is much harder to do, but I'll say this, that's where the church should excel. Now, Fox News does it better, MSNBC does it better, and our politicians seem to be doing it better. But that's the job of the church to change the imagination and narratives that are broken in the world and offer what I would call the counter-narratives. So, for example, if the broken narrative is one of triumphalism and exceptionalism and hyper-individualism and consumerism and materialism, are you going to beat that narrative with more of the same? So our world is caught up in consumerism and materialism, and so we build our churches on consumerism and materialism. Our world is caught up in exceptionalism and triumphalism, and we build our churches on exceptionalism and triumphalism when counter-narratives are necessary. And this is where biblical evangelism and biblical justice is the counter-narrative to the broken narratives in our society. Not to build on the broken narratives, but actually to offer the counter-narratives. And I want to uh, examine this by looking at the work of um, Doug and Judy Hall, at, uh, at, uh, uh, retired from gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And they examine the difference between primary culture and secondary culture. Primary culture is on the left column, secondary culture is on the right-hand column. Primary culture is what we might call kind of older cultures that are uh, more tribal, uh, primary cultures focus on personal relationships. The priority is personal relationships. If you survive in a primary culture, you need relationships to survive. Your, uh, your advancement is not based upon achievement necessarily. It's based upon relationships. Uh, primary culture is uh, more on personal and oral communication. And um, primary culture, everything is more direct, hands-on, uh, personal touching, not so much distance. Uh, in primary culture, art, music, drama, and stories drive primary culture. You compare that to what most of us know more readily, which is secondary culture, because we live in an industrialized society. Secondary culture is more impersonal. Uh, it depends on knowledge to grow and to expand versus relationships. Secondary culture does not have extended family, it has post-nuclear families. You think more scientifically and objectively rather than spiritually, mystically. And written communication dominates rather than oral communication. So here's an example. So I worked at uh, MIT as, a, as an InterVarsity staff worker for many years. And I would hear stories about the communication skills or lack thereof of MIT students. It's fascinating. They would be roommates. They would be in the same room. Their seat backs will be touching each other but they're texting each other on the computer. That's secondary culture. All they have to do is turn their chairs around and talk face to face. That's primary culture. But they're so used to secondary culture, and that is our kind of dominant mode of communication. So in a primary culture, you walk down the street to your neighbor, you actually, uh, the neighbor pours a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and over that tea, you talk about the issues that are going on, right? That's primary. Because communication is not just the words you say, but it is also the, the presence. It is also the body language. That's a huge part of communication. But in a secondary culture, what do you do? You send an angry text. You send a quick word, and that person gets a text, 
And like, wh why did that person capitalize? That seems really offensive. Why did that person use an exclamation mark? I is he angry at me? So that becomes the mode of communication that most of us engage. Emails, texts. Uh, there's so many ways that we can communicate using written and machines as communications, and we lose the primary culture. And so what we see in most of our uh, evangelism now is secondary culture geared and not primary culture geared. We build these um, modes of communication that communicates more out of like a, uh, uh, what is the word, logical for spiritual laws, which are great, but it is it can be done by anybody. The person doesn't matter. That's secondary culture. When you communicate the gospel and the person who communicates it doesn't matter, that's secondary culture. When you communicate the gospel and the person matters, that's primary culture. Historically, you could argue that primary culture has dominated world history for most of human history, but in the most recent years, secondary culture has become the dominant mode of communication. Now, what's interesting for me as someone who looks at church growth and evangelism, I can say, where is that intersection of primary and secondary culture? What happened in that moment that you're seeing where it crisscrosses? Well, it turns out that it, it was about zero AD when Christ comes into the world. So he lives, Jesus operates and moves in a very primary culture, Jewish society. Very primary culture. Your identity is based upon your tribal affiliation. Your identity is based upon, well, I'm a carpenter's son, so therefore I must be a carpenter. That's a very primary cultural mode of, of understanding and living in the world. There's high value about, uh, about relationships, relationships over, uh, um, uh, over a material wealth. Uh, but that primary culture is expressed in a hyper social cultural, uh, secondary cultural context known as the Roman Empire. In fact, what we see in Acts chapter 2 is that example of how a primary culture and a secondary culture intersect in such a way that the church actually grows in this context. So this is uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. I've restructured this a little bit. Uh, I've, I'm following the, the way it's written, but I've given you a restructuring to kind of demonstrate how Acts chapter 2 teaches a mode of evangelism that is the intersection of primary and secondary culture. Most people, when they read Acts 2, get excited about church growth, chapter 2, verse 41, and chapter 2, verse 47, and say, hey, we want to grow the church. We want to evangelize. We want people to come to faith. And what oftentimes happens in the interpretation of Acts chapter 2 is they look at the passage above chapter 2, verse 41 and following. And what is above chapter 2, verse 41 and following? Peter's sermon. And so most of us think about how do you grow a church? How do you do successful evangelism? We preach. Now, that's not, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that's our first kind of secondary culture assumption. The church grows because Peter preached a great sermon. That's not wrong, but it's incomplete. Because what happens is the church grows because Peter preached a good sermon, but there's something also happening in this passage that demonstrates. So Peter proclaims the gospel, but the church demonstrates the gospel. And the combination of the proclamation of the good word, evangelism, and the demonstration of the good news, justice, is what causes the church to grow. So in this particular passage, you see a framing device. This passage begins with numerical growth and ends with numerical growth. And then it starts moving towards the center, you might notice. So the statement after the Roman numeral one is A, which says, let's talk about what's going on in the church. They have fellowship, they teach, they break bread, there's prayer, and the outsiders are amazed. But then if you go to the bottom and work your way up, it follows the same structure. And there you're seeing characteristics of the church. There's fellowship, temple meetings, breaking bread, praise, and the outsiders are amazed. And you will see that from the top, it moves to the middle. From the bottom, it moves to the middle. Uh, New Testament scholars call this the chiastic structure because it looks like the Greek letter X. It's all over the Bible. You'll see this once you see it. You can't stop seeing it. It's the chiastic structure in the New Testament. It's just a basic, it's like the three-point sermon. It's a, a, a way of communicating that also uses the form. So here you're beginning from the outside and moving towards the middle. Uh, Nils Lund, a, a New Testament scholar, uh, says that in all probability, the intention of a chiastic structure 
is that the outside is the effect and the middle is the cause. So if we're talking about what is the effect, growth of the church, evangelism, what is the cause? Not necessarily just Peter's sermon, but the self-sacrificial living of the church. They sold all they had in common and they gave to the poor as those who had need. That sounds like justice to me. That sounds like social action to me. That sounds like, well, socialism to me. That sounds like something stuff that, hey, the church doesn't do that. The church doesn't take money and then redistribute that. But actually, that's exactly what the church did. And if we're following the structure, it seems like social justice, biblical social justice leads to the growth of the church. In other words, justice and evangelism in the scriptures goes hand in hand, side by side. They are not separated out. They go hand in hand and side by side. It, in fact, if you look at church history, 2,000 years, the last 2,000 years of church history, it is only in the last 100 years in the West, oh, and I would be more specific, in the white Western church, that you actually see the churches operate with a, um, a, a bifurcation of justice and evangelism, a separation of justice and evangelism. Uh, David Moberg writes about this in The Great Reversal, that for 1,900 years of church history, justice and evangelism went side by side. In the early church, justice and evangelism went side by side. It's only in the last 100 years because of cultural pressures that you began to see the split of justice and evangelism. You see this example in the early church, Rodney Stark, in his book, The Rise of Christianity. He examines how did a small sect of Judaism, a subset of Judaism, go from this kind of scared, frightened group of fishermen and, and tax collectors in an upper room and becomes the, the massive movement of, of religion by the third century. Uh, the, the theory is that when uh, Constantine announces that uh, Christianity is the religion of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, it actually him, is him acknowledging reality rather than creating reality, meaning the church was already there. The church was already in place as the dominant religion of that empire. And so uh, Stark asked that question. How do you go from the early church, which was scared and hiding out, to this massive uh, international global movement? And Stark points out three things that I think are helpful for us. One, I'll start from the bottom up, the positive treatment of women. That's not a bad lesson for us to learn in the 21st century, by the way. The treatment of women, the honoring of women in their midst was one of the factors of that growth. The second is that conversion was occurring along relational networks, primary culture. It was friendships. It was friendships that was happening. But here's the third one that was really interesting. And that was that uh, uh, during that 100 years, uh, 300 years that the church is kind of becoming this uh, movement, uh, the church in, in, uh, in the Roman Empire, um, there were many, many uh, uh, plagues that just would run rampant throughout these urban centers. And uh, what would happen is, like, the, obviously the sewage and the sanitation was really bad in these urban centers. The sewage line ran through the middle of the city. And so if one person got sick, everybody in that city got sick. And so what would happen oftentimes, especially when the women and children got sick, the pagan men would leave and abandon their families and run to the hills. In fact, that's where the word pagan comes from. Pagan means country bumpkin. It would mean those who were non-believers who ran to the hills when these things are happening. The who stayed? It was the Christians. The Christians stayed, and they gave very basic social care. They provided clean water, helped people through their fevers, and provided sanitation, and just kind of nursed these individuals with a show of compassion, mercy, and justice. They cared for those who were in their communities, and they survived. And then the men would return and find that their wives and their children had converted to Christianity. That's why Paul says, not husbands stay with your wives, but wives stay with your husband, because that is more likely the scenario that was going on in the Roman Empire at the time. So what we're seeing here is Stark is pointing out that this conversion, this massive growth of the church in the first three centuries, is not just the proclamation of the gospel, but it is also the demonstration of the gospel. And that justice and evangelism, biblically, historically, has always gone hand in hand. And here is where I want to close. Where are we now? We're at a point now where primary culture has been very much diminished. And I would say COVID added to that. 
We moved everything to secondary culture relation, uh, connections, right? Kids are going to school via Zoom. Uh, all the classes are Zoom. And you're disconnected even more. And everything is done through machines and not through personal relationships. So we went through this extreme of becoming a, a secondary culture dominated society. We're still trying to figure out what that looks like. But here's what's interesting to me in, in my sense of what's happening with millennials and with Zoomers. While their primary cultural experience is low, their desire for primary culture is high. That's why there's a dotted line there. Their actual experience of primary culture is low, but their longing for primary cultural connection is extremely high. So you can see this, how they long for community, but the only way to get that community affirmation is through TikTok, is through Snapchat, is through Instagram. They're getting that community affirmation through secondary means because in their hearts, they're still longing for that primary cultural connection. And so in this moment, where we are experiencing a low lull of primary culture, yet the longing is there for primary culture, that is where the demonstration of the gospel comes in. Because the proclamation of the gospel, yeah, you can use internet, media, and all these secondary structural forms, but the demonstration of the gospel is in primary cultural terms. Has to be relational, has to be incarnational, has to be uh, embodied has to be actually on the ground in the local church, the expression of the demonstration of the gospel. Let me pause there, and we're going to go into table discussion and Q&A.